are free to, to, to let the people, to, the others, to hear your voice. If any government uh, let you free in what you believe and uh, you practice your religion, so it's okay with that government. But we can deny, I'm telling you the truth, that the President of the United States of America is a Protestant and he is, uh, he is a, a proud, a fool, huh? He's, he's a proud that he is a, he has this religion. But they don't say that. Maybe they don't say that it's a Christian uh, state or a Christian government. So because of that also when the BB said we wanted the, uh, the PLO or the Palestinian uh, leadership uh, to, uh, to confess that uh, the Israeli government is a, a Jewish state, the, the Palestinian leaders of course refused and also a lot of rabbis say why you want the people to confess that? You are the uh, Prime Minister and all of the leadership is, is Jewish, so no need to let the people uh, agree or sign that it's a, a Jewish uh, state. But it's uh, in, the, on, in fact, on the ground, it's a Jewish state. Okay, can we, can we, thank you, that was a, for, for us I think it was a remark, remarkable insight into how the situation is read through the eyes of different faith groups. But uh, let's have some more questions. Yeah. Ms. Lady. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for it was a very interesting discussion. My question sort of links into it, but it takes it off in a slightly different direction. I was uncomfortable about the year Hajashad language that Rebecca used. Not primarily for the reason that you gave, Selim, which was everybody should be equal, but because, and I have to confess I've been guilty of it myself at times, that when you start talking about Palestinians as gay, and you use that language of, of Palestinians, then implicitly you are saying that they are immigrants, sojourners, migrants, whatever you choose to translate the word gay with but you're actually not acknowledging their own claim to existence and, and, and rights in the land on the same basis as that of the Jewish community. And, and so I think this is an actually particular question to Rebecca. It, it might almost be that I'd be interested to hear Sharon and, and Salim as well on, on, on that one. But that I was quite uncomfortable about the yeah, I, I said that already in the beginning before saying that, yeah. that I am not here at the shop, that means I am the indigenous spiritual person of the land. That's what I meant. Sure. Sharon, sure, anything you'd like to say and then we'll go we'll across your back. Yes, uh, uh, again, this is a question of whether we can take halakha, Jewish law, in order to really interpret what is happening in the modern day and age. And, um, uh, I would really follow what Salim said in that our religious leaders have become clerics as opposed to prophets because they are in positions uh, of political power and that there is an absolute need to remove religious leaders from that position in order to enable them to flourish and truly talk about Judaism, I will speak about Judaism specifically, as a, a religion that is welcoming and opening and open and can attract people with its beauty as opposed to uh, the way it is being seen at the moment. Rebecca? Sure. If you are um, saying that basically religion is only feel good and sort of tokenism and doesn't have the intellectual framework to deal on the ground with actual problems, this is the source, and I'm convinced that the position of the Gerto shop, you can say we have a wonderful secular world. There are 1.7 million Palestinian refugees in camps in the Holy Land. Okay, if they were Gerto Shav, they would be out of those camps. I am convinced, I think Gerto Shav doesn't have the connotation that we think it has. The 
they wouldn't be there. They would be able to travel and live wherever they want. Is there, is there, is there that means is, the narrative. Can we, can we and we don't have this? layers of narratives. So what if I say, you're a Gerto Shav, and you say, well, I don't think I'm a Gerto Shav. You'll have your narrative, and we will have overlapping narratives in the same land, <coughs> expanded narratives. As I say, they are Gerto Shav. I'm aware that I want them to say, we are moving them. Okay? I'm not saying my religion brands everybody else Gerto Shav and everybody else righteous Gentile status. Aren't I benevolent? I'm saying my religion brands that. And their religion and their position is benevolently guaranteeing me people of the book and mooming. I can live with that dichotomy in my mind. I don't feel put down. I don't feel put down because I've expanded the narrative. And I like the way it resonates in another people. I, I think you would, I think with a little more study of all these human rights that you like are from, are from scripture. Okay. okay, thank you. Yes, this gentleman over here. Uh, I'd like to speak to you. Sorry, this gentleman. I want to say something. Uh, the essence of happiness of the humanity is the uh, mutual respect in between the religions. Allah in the Quran says, "No hatred in the deen." And God says uh, in the Quran. We want uh, kind of put power on any person to, to have a specific religion. I want to say a phrase that we say in Palestine, in West Bank. If we're in Bethlehem city, uh, we want to have a Messianic Spontaneously, we will respect the life or the Christianity which is in this city, the Christianity. Even the sheikhs, uh, the most respect, uh, respected sheikhs, they always say that in a community, for example, قد يعني حتى يعني حتى قد يعني انتقادات ولو بسيطة قد تزعجهم. So even in the even the highest respectful sheikh say when we're in different like under a different religion in a certain city as for example in Bethlehem we won't say we won't yeah for it's in a city we won't say anything that criticizes that religion that we live among. Another example that I want to say is that the president of the country has a city like Bethlehem and Ramallah. Yeah, the mayor in Ramallah and Bethlehem in the law uh, in Palestine has to be a Christian in these cities. Even though the majority are Muslims, and the, yeah, and the president is Muslim, Muhammad Abbas and Arafat is Muslim. But in the law, until today, the mayor of these cities has to be Christian. And no Muslim or Jew can be even a candidate for this position. And we accept this. And we accept this. فلذلك يجب أن نركز على وطبعاً بسبب إنه في مسيحيين وفي في هذه المدينة ولذلك يجب أن نركز على احترام كل منا الآخر. وهذا هو ما يوجد الحياة المشتركة اللي تكون مبنية على السعادة في كل البشر.
Now we have another seven minutes until we stop, so please uh, take very this brief. Um, I mean, I've been very impressed by the attempts to find, difficult than they obviously are, find common ground. And I recall Sharon talking about neutral ground. Um, and one of the examples you gave Sharon, if I heard you correctly, was influence that your organization has had in um, uh, working with personnel from police and pre-military service. And that struck me, uh, picking up your uh, prompt to be deal with practical issues. I, I would be interested to know to what extent, given the political power that must rest over police forces and military in Israel, to what extent that sort of reconciliatory work or getting, getting uh, policemen and soldiers to be to understand what they're dealing with and the rights, human rights that are involved in their work. And this, I thought was a very interesting practical example. I just wonder, is something, is there an example here that you could expand on for us? Please. Sure, we'd like to leave with this and then we take another question immediately afterwards. <clears throat> The question. Uh, it's actually very interesting what's happening with the police, and I would differentiate between the work that we've done with the police and the work we've done with the pre army groups. Because with the police, we obviously met them at a place where they really felt a lack within their own uh, uh, work. Uh, these are policemen who are the police station that is dealing with law and order through the whole old city of Jerusalem. And uh, there are constant, uh, there's constant violence and tension that is going on in that place. And uh, I think what's interesting is that in the past, they've always looked at it as a need to keep law and order according to the law of the land. And uh, I would add that there is a new police commander in the old city who recognizes that we need to find win-win solutions, and that uh, religion also plays its part. What's interesting, actually, we're finding is that generally there is a greater recognition of the role of religion in peacekeeping. Uh, if in the past, you know, all over the world, I think that uh, certainly at the end of the 20th century, everybody thought the religion was dead. You know, it has really come up and shown us that it is not. And, um, and politicians, and, and that by reference, uh, also those who are keeping the laws of the politicians are seeing that there is a need to include religion within it. And therefore, uh, we, uh, we found with the support of the police commander that this, uh, this is answering a very deep need that they have to try and find different solutions to the ones that they've been using in the past which have not worked. Quite frankly, uh, as far as the um, pre-army groups are concerned, I think that is coming more. Uh, we are offering that to them, and they don't even realise that this is a lack for them until they come to the workshops and the site visits. And uh, we, therefore, it really is awareness raising. Uh, unfortunately, in, in Israel uh, and also in Palestine, but I, I know Israel's educational system much better. We are so compartmentalized. Well, not only are we divided by language with um, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel learning in Arabic and uh, Israeli Jewish citizens learning in Hebrew, but we're also divided with uh, national religious schools, national secular schools, uh, ultra-Orthodox schools, uh, private schools which have their own um, uh, direction, and they don't meet at all. So not only do they not meet at all, they're working, they're living within their own little communities, but they also don't learn about other religions at all. Uh, very few. It's almost nothing. And therefore, the need for, for religious education or, inter or a religious education about other religions, let alone their own, because they're the Jewish secular schools. There's no real knowledge of Judaism either. Um, that, that needs to take place informally. 
and uh, we're finding that we really have a niche in doing this there. And just one small example, what we do is with these young people who are, we're only working with the Jewish pre army youth at the moment, we bring all sorts of artifacts for them to hold and touch, and we ask them to choose something, uh, uh, artifacts about the different religions, so it could be a rosary, or it could be a Quran, it could be a um, uh, hijab, uh, that they would put on all different things to do with the religion, and we ask them why they have chosen they uh, chosen the artifact or the article that they have taken, or uh, whether it what has attracted to them, or whether it has repelled them, uh, what has repelled them, and and one story. I mean, I remember so clearly this uh, Jewish boy picking up the Quran, and he said, "I live in the Middle East. I." was born and brought up here. I have never held a Quran. I don't know what is inside it. And if I'm going to be living in Israel, I really need to know about what's in there because it affects my life so much. Or another story about a girl who picked up a rosary. And uh, she said, I picked this up because my grandmother is a Catholic, a believing Catholic living in Poland. And I remember with great love my time with my grandmother. And although I have come to live in Israel and I have now converted to Judaism, I this I feel very close to this rosary. And we we saw immediately from the surprise of all the other people around them that they had no idea that this had been her background at all. And we were proud that she felt comfortable enough to actually say that within the group. So these are the sorts of things, just little stories, but they make a very big difference. Uh, thank you. Our time is almost gone, Mike. No, we did. Okay. Okay. Last word. Yeah, I think it's very important. It's very difficult to be police managers, and no doubt about it. It's very, uh, very complex and very sensitive. Well, there is another dimension of police work in Jerusalem. It is fulfilling policy, political uh, purpose. And the police is being used, uh, for example, in Silwan to move Palestinians from their home and turn Silwan into Jewish neighborhood, the tourist neighborhood. And that is something that's happening. The easy trigger in Shafat a week ago on, uh, on Palestinian boy, and, 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 and the there is a problem in the culture and the behavior of the policeman in two levels. One on the personal level, that's so much hatred in our culture and fear and all of that, but the other aspect of it, that the police in Jerusalem fulfilling a policy to prevent uh, division of the, and, and moving into East Jerusalem Palestinian neighborhood. Uh, and, and here, how you deal with that, how you deal with the fact that the police is not only policing, is not protecting people, policing is part of the policy of the government to change the reality on the ground. And, and that is also we need to address. Okay, thank you, Stanley. Would you like to uh, give a round of applause to our three people? Okay, thank you very much to our first three speakers and everybody else who contributed, also to Reverend Dr. Kenneth Newell for so kindly chairing the discussion. We will have a very, very quick coffee break. Upstairs, uh, we have coffee provided and tea. Um, if we could all be back in here at 4.15 sharp, so 15 minutes exactly, we will then have Rabbi Hanan, Shehina, uh, Khaled, Khaled Abu Awad, Sheikh Abu Khaled Tamimi, and uh, Yehuda Shorov. Um, all four of these very eminent speakers um, will then be uh, presenting their work, taking your questions. So, take time around, enjoy your coffee. Thank you.